Welcome to Trashy Divorces. Hey, everybody. Another week of Trashy Divorces. I'm Stacy. I'm Alicia. Thanks for coming to join us for this week where we are not supermen. Life is sort of getting in the way with us this week. So we're pulling out our Everything is superman fine, story. But sometimes life intervenes. So we have delightful tales that first appeared on Patreon for you this week. We do. And we're going to go one additional week in this season because the stories we have coming for you next week are super, uh, we're wonderful, bang up excited about it. So all so, of that's good. Pulling a little bit out of the Patreon vault. We're starting this week, Stacy, with your trashy founding father. This is um, a sort of forgotten founder, but he was a I had no idea. signer of the Constitution and the Articles of Confederation or whatever, Governor Morris of New York and Pennsylvania and... Some France problematic and... medical history, too. Woo! Yeah, <laughs> interesting guy. Um, so I think it makes sense that he is not foremost in our telling of the early days of the Republic. Um, you have somebody a little more modern. The 20th century Superman, mm -hmm. so to speak. I'm bringing you the tale this week of TV Superman, George Reeves. The OG. And his, yeah, the OG Superman. His trashy divorces, his trashy affair. His trashy true crime. Yeah, his yeah. trashy, suspicious death mm -hmm, mm -hmm. coming for you this week. Before we kick off our stories, let's give a big thanks to our new Patreon supporters this week in Absolutely. the Magic Mirror. Thank you so much to Brooke, Neptune, Danielle, Raylan, Elizabeth, Barbie, Pamela, and Angela. And a new super supporter, Tanya H., this week, as well as a new annual super supporter, Christine M. Thank you, all of our Patreon folks. All right, so what did our awesome patrons hear this week on Patreon? This week, our continuing American Woman series, I covered Boston's legendary Isabella Stewart Gardner. We did a follow-up on the Gardner Museum heist. The heist at the museum. Which is really fun. And you did a story about murdering father-in-laws this week. father-in-law who just was like, you know what, baby daughter, I'm just going to have your shitbag husband assassinated. I mean, it's one way to... Get around a pesky, trashy divorce. <laughs> you can check us out over on patreon.com slash trashy divorces for more trashy goodness over there. Oh, and also, if you have ever wanted to hear your trash spectacular story read on trashy divorces, now is the time for you to send us your trashy divorces, your trashy weddings, your trashy mother-in-laws, your trashy bridesmaids, whatever trash you want to hear in your coded language, of course, send to us. We're going to be doing a fun holiday. Oh, we hope. We hope we're doing a fun holiday. <laughs> your stories will make the difference. Your stories will make the difference. <laughs> so it is the most wonderful time of the year. Now is your chance to be featured sure. on Trashy Divorces. Where do people send those emails, Stacey? Send them to trashydivorces at gmail.com, which I think we both keep open constantly. And it's exciting what lands in that mailbox sometimes. It is. It really is. Yeah. Anyway, looking forward to all that. Thanks, everybody, for coming back for another week. We hope you enjoy the Superman Spectaculars. I can do anything. Don't operate on yourself with a whalebone. Handy tip. <laughs> I don't know if you had that on your bingo card. <laughs> uh, Alicia, what should what should we do now? Oh, gosh. We should go, go, go. So, Stacey, you kind of have a trashy politics, but really more of a trashy founding father? I wasn't sure where to put this, because we have a lot of categories, but we don't have trashy founding fathers yet. But I know we both want to cover Benjamin Franklin in particular. So, so badly. Oh, and TJ. T okay, actually, yes, they're all trash bags. Yeah, aren't they? there's a lot of there's a lot of trash baggery to go. Paul it's Revere, basically, like what? the country was founded by a bunch of Rudy Giuliani's. Sam Adams, Sons of Liberty. You know what? If good, I could only find good beer, Sam though. Adams beer. Good beer, though. And we I will have to a, tell y'all that story a at a okay. different time. Anyway. Who have you got for us today in Trashy? Who's kicking off? I have one of the lesser known founding fathers. Talk, talk to me. Sure. I want to try to pronounce his name correctly. According to Abigail Adams, hey. his Abby name, Abby A., uh, his name is pronounced Governor Morris. Governor. He, well, Governor, he, um, his family, French Huguenots. Okay. 
French Protestants, I guess, in a Catholic nation, it's all of that stuff is so hard to follow if I didn't deep dive and I didn't. Apparently, they moved to Holland, which then led them to New Amsterdam, which is New now York. New York. Yeah. Yes. This is me. Which I can't hear New Amsterdam without thinking County I Coast. know. This uh, is yeah. me riffing on a history.com article. We will have the article in the show notes. Governor Morris was born January the 31st of 1752. Oh, Aquarius. An Aquarius boy. Yeah. He would grow up to be uh, an American statesman, even though America did not exist when he was born. Weird, that. Founding father. He was part of, he, he signed both the Articles of Confederation and the United States Constitution. Fantastic. Yeah. He was like kind of a heavy hitter for a long time. Kind he, of a big deal. He wrote the preamble to the Constitution, which also, big deal. This Is er- anyone else singing Schoolhouse Rock in their head right now? Cause... This earned him the title Penman of the Constitution. Oh, my. Why don't we know about this guy? How come I've never heard about him? I How think trashy was he? he? Was, I think because he was this so trashy. trashy. Yeah, okay. he was also a United States senator from the state of New York from oh. 1800 to 1803. He, I'll get into this, but he wanted us to, he wanted a bunch of states in New England and New York to secede because of the War of 1812. He he thought the Constitution had failed. So did he come in after Aaron Burr? Won oh. His seat? Yeah. That is after a great... After he de- defeated Skyler? That is a great question. We'll follow up on that for future trashy founding fathers. Do you have your phone? You yeah. Google that shizzle. But yeah, I feel... Because Hamilton died in 1804, right? Hamilton died in 1804, and the defeat of Skyler happened before then. Right. I'm thinking... Well, I guess there are two senators, so maybe they... They may have served concurrently. I don't know. Okay. The Google has told me <laughs> that Aaron Burr was actually in office as a senator from New York State from March of 1791 to March of 1797. Okay. And here's something actually kind of interesting. He was preceded by Philip Schuyler and succeeded by Philip Schuyler. Philip Schuyler took his own oh, seat that's back. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And then Burr ran for VP. Got to take my Senate seat back. When it was a separate office. When it was yeah. like... Because the Constitution just envisioned ambitious vice presidents from a different party killing the president who had separately been elected. History, yo. It is so much fun. I love I, it. Like, I know. So in the... Uh, Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed last night. And Mitch McConnell did this thing about Democrats think the founders botched the Constitution. But in fact, the founders kind of did. And we've amended the thing 27 or 28 times because of it. Yeah. There was a lot of stuff they got wrong. There was a lot of stuff they didn't envision. There was a lot of... They did envision that the future would be different than where they lived, which is why they included the amendment process. That was not botching. Anyway. History. We're going to move Please on. Please continue your story. Governor Morris... <laughs> Again, his name is derived from his mother's Huguenot French Protestant name, surname, pronounced Gouverneur. This was her last name, is what that means. He also had quite the life of adventure, and the myths and legends surrounding him are a delightful little corner of Americana. And trashy. And trashy. Here (laughs) are a few things known or speculated about Gouverneur Morris. Okay, tell me. To brighten your day. Awesome. In these dark times. (laughs) He's a little accident prone. Oh, no. <laughs> he missed a year of classes at King's College when he was 14 after he dropped a kettle of boiling water that scalded the entire right side of his body, Holy including his shit. arm. What? Luckily, the injuries did not become gangrenous because that would have necessitated amputating his arm. Or I guess if the body wounds had become gangrenous, it would have just am- necessitated him dying. So, Oh, my God. Good times. But King's College. He would face amputation anyway. Oh, no. Because in 1780, holy shit! some say there was a carriage accident. There are other stories. Anyway, he what what is known to be true is that his left ankle and leg bones were mangled. His regular doctor was out of town. Oh, no. And so the attending physicians at, I'm guessing, the Hospital of New York, I don't know, were like, hey, dude. Sorry, but the legs gotta, gotta go. go. There's no way to fix this. Um, so he's like, yeah, please save my life. Okay, this is going to hurt, but let's do it. Okay, then his regular doctor shows back up nope. and is like, no oh, I could have totally saved this, oh, which shit. I think is a lie. I mean, let's be real. Oh, my God. Anyway. So now he's got a peg leg? Got a peg leg. Okay. For <laughs> sure. Oh, but the other thing is he 
his whole life, like the, I'm telling you, Rudy Giuliani founded this country. He was a ladies' man. Oh, charmer, a big charmer. So the alternate story to the carriage accident oh, thing shit. is that he was forced to jump out of um, a, a a married lady's balcony um, to escape the wrath of her husband, who had discovered him fucking her in oh, the 1780 <sighs> boudoir. Whoa. He continued with his peg leg to ride horses, climb church steeples. Was Seduce that a thing? Women. Sure. Undoubtedly. Um, River Rapids. He loved boating, I guess. Don't, <laughs> don't know if he was part of that George Washington fishing trip with Hamilton and Burr, which I'm sure went great. <laughs> Team 86 Trout. He was a great dancer. He would cut a rug with that peg leg, which may have been a that real, is amazing. A real thing. And apparently it did not diminish... His, his sex life interest in the married ladies. Uh, so John Jay, Supreme Court Justice, one of the first, I believe, yeah. said that he wished Morris had lost something else. <gasps> oh, that is a straight up diss right there. Whoa. Um, all right. So he did not begin the process of American independence as a radical. And in fact, the revolution broke up his family. He early on had fears of like the tyranny of the mob, whatever. Ended up backing the Patriot cause after Lexington and Concord in 1775. Okay. He had a half-brother who was also a signer of the Declaration of Independence, so they were cool. But he had another half-brother who was a general in the British Army. Oh, that's a complicated Thanksgiving. I think he was actually a major general, but in any case, uh, two of his sisters was married. Was he a modern Major general? He was a Sorry. old-timey major general. Nah, anyway, um, two uh. sisters who married loyalists. His mother was a loyalist, and mm. so he did not see her for the duration of the war. How prescient is all of this? He was made homeless because he could not stay at... Like, his mom let British officers camp at their home. Um, I'm Mo giving British officers your bedroom, Governor. <laughs> Morrisania. <laughs> oh, God. Like, Morrisville, whatever. Okay, they had an estate. So yeah, I guess it, it wasn't very cool for him to hang out with all the British officers since he was on our side. Okay, so after the war, he went back we to... Back to New York. Philadelphia. Oh, <laughs> close enough. <laughs> <laughs> he was a New York native, but he went back to Philadelphia. No, he moved to Philadelphia, lived there for like a decade. And is uh, appointed as a Pennsylvania delegate to the Constitutional Convention. Okay. After the Articles of Confederation have utterly failed to allow governance. <laughs> sure. Which seems problematic. Does that seem problematic if you can't govern your country and, like, I don't know, a pandemic hits and you can't do shit about it because, I don't know, Mitch McConnell? Anyway, they just... These founding fathers, baby. These. Go they back. decide to scrap the articles, maybe make some reforms, come up with something a little better, a little more... Able to respond to the needs of the day. What do they make? They make the Constitution. Yay. And um, Governor Morris like speaks more at the Constitution than anyone else. He delivers 173 speeches. Holy cats. Uh, James Madison, by comparison, delivered 161. And James Wilson delivered 168. And he was one of the few delegates who was explicitly opposed to slavery. Like he spoke a lot. Right on. About, yeah. Right on about the evils of slavery. He was part of the Constitutional Convention's Committee of Style. <laughs> so he polished, like, the final draft of the... He was a copy editor okay. for the U.S. Fantastic. Constitution. Yeah, James Madison would say, the finish given to the style and arrangement of the Constitution fairly belongs to the pen of Mr. Morris, which is how he came to be known as the penman of the Constitution. Huh. So he, he tightened the text up. He made it sing, according to this History.com article. Well, that's nice. Uh, and he changed the preamble from, we the people of the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, etc. We the people of the United States. Yep. Hold on. Um, let me see if I can do it without singing it. In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and provide for the common defense, do... Uh -uh. Solemnly swear. <laughs> no. Uh, promote the general welfare and then secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the 
United States of America. Sorry. I test myself every once in a while. Brain fog. I'm 48, man. I do. You got to give yourself little tests in the day. <laughs> All right. Um, I think this is also going to turn me on. Intersect with your Hamilton love. Seven, oh, tell me, tell me. 1789. <gasps> President Jorge Washington. Oh, George Washington. Sorry. <laughs> appoints Governor Morris as minister to France, which I believe TJ yeah. f- had famously come home from. Do we know when that was? TJ, Ben Franklin was minister to France. As well, if there, I'm not mistaken. I guess there may have been multiples. Gouverneur was the only one to stay in Paris during the worst violence of the French Revolution. Of the French Revolution. Interesting. So maybe the rest came home because of the heads in the basket issue. <laughs> <laughs> seems seems like a thing. Hold on. Uh, the ambassador to France. Looks like Ben Franklin was appointed minister to France in 1778. John Jay was appointed minister to Spain in 1779. John Adams to Holland in 1780. I knew John Adams. Yeah, that's in um, the HBO Adams biopic series or whatever. So it looks like Ben Franklin was there first. TJ was there after and then Governor Morris. It goes Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, William Short, and then Guvna, Gavirner, whatever you just said, Morris. That's fascinating. History, yeah. And actually, at this time, they were ministers to the court of Versailles. They he, become ministers to the First Republic in 1792. I was going to say he was with minis- James Monroe. He was minister from 1792 to 1794. And then France changes to the First Republic. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's something kind of fascinating. So James Monroe is the first ambassador to France during the ministers of the First Republic. But Charles C. Pickney is the next minister to the First Republic, and I'm related to him. He's in our family tree. Cool. That's great. Okay. So he's a dead in-law of mine. By marriage, yes. I in law yes <laughs> okay none of that's important go back to governor words. morris traveled to paris for business in 1789 and i guess stayed put three years later so- a hell of a time to go visit france <laughs> yes 1792 george <clears throat> george washington appoints him minister to france as you say he shared those duties with other notables mm-hmm but he was the only person who hung out in Paris during the worst violence of the it's French remarkable. Revolution. And I guess his diaries have provided some you know, some context. Valuable. He's the Chapuis. He's the Chapuis. <laughs> of the French Revolution. Of the Reign of Terror. <laughs> While there, he had a few lady friends. Really? Uh, yeah, he had, a, a he had a three-year love affair with the novelist Comtesse. I... Never know. Comtessa? Comtesse? Sure. Adelaide de Flehout, who was married to a count, 35 years older than she was. Wow. And she lived in an apartment in the Louvre, obviously before well, match, it became an yeah. art museum. Uh, de Flehout, Count, uh, Countess Adelaide, whatever, sure. <laughs> um, was also lovers with Talleyrand, who would later sell the Louisiana Purchase no. to the United States as in Napoleon. Foreign minister. Huh. So he comes home. In they eight- didn't teach me that in Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> yeah, I feel like he and Ben Franklin, I guess at separate times, but they really played it up in Paris. They had a well, good time. I'm certain Ben Franklin left a nifty note in the drawer like, dude, these are the places I go to. Yo. Welcome to Paris. Seriously. Because Ben Franklin, yo. Whoa. Must have been a charmer. We were founded by Rudy Giuliani's. It's I'm sad. <laughs> I am sad to report. 1807, Morris serves on a three-person, well, three-man commission. Sorry. I guess we don't need to gender neutral that. Okay. Which planned out New York City's grid, like traffic grid. Interesting. Okay. Yep. So 12 parallel avenues intersected by 155 streets. So he was instrumental in that also in the erie canal which was a big uh economic boost to the city okay 1809 
at the age of 57, Governor Morris decides it's time to settle down. Oh. So at a uh, he holds a Christmas party that year. Okay. And turns it into quite the thing when he announces that he has married his housekeeper. Holy cow. And Carrie Nancy, I'm um, air quote, whatever. Nancy Rudolph. Oh, my God. 22 years younger. Oh, my God. The marriage was scandalous because Nancy and her brother-in-law, Richard Randolph, had in September of 1792, been accused of killing a newborn baby what? who was suspected of being their illegitim- <gasps> illegitimate child. Oh, my God. So Nancy, until she died, would insist that this baby had been stillborn. Meanwhile, but governor becomes... She fucked her brother-in-law? Well... And then Morris marries her? They were cleared. Fuck. Nothing could be proven. I mean, I, yeah. Were you in the room when it happened? Were you in the... Anyway... Okay, so Governor becomes a father for the first time. Sure. At the age of 61. Oh, my God. When Nancy gave birth to a baby boy in 1813. Okay. We're going to back up one year. This is where he's like, War of 1812, this is not what America should be, and decides that, yeah, New York and New England should secede from the United States. Oh, Jesus. Um, he thought that the war was a plot among the slaveholding states in the South to invade and conquer Canada. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, he, you know, <laughs> the penman of the Constitution decided in 1812 that it was a failure. <laughs> it was time to try again. Oh, my. All right. So after suffering from crippling gout throughout late 1816, Gouverneur developed a bit of an obstruction in a place that should flow freely. Oh. His urinary tract. <gasps> so, dude, I don't know what the normal treatment for this would have been in 1816. Ooh. But what Governor Morris did was he... Nope. Took a piece nope, of me. whale bone... Nope. And oh. uh, inserted that into his urethra to try nope. to clear the blockage. Why would you think that that was gonna work? It sounds like he'd had great earlier experiences with doctors, so. <laughs> it's medical care in America's crap. I'll do it myself. <laughs> God. Um, if you're not sure where this is going, the procedure. Do not try this at home. Did not work. It caused internal Ooh. injuries. It caused internal infection. Ow. And Governor Morris died on the 6th of November, 1816, in the same room Yikes. in which he was born 64 years earlier on his loyalist family's estate. Oh, of so he did get to go home in the end. Morrisania. Morrisania. I guess after, they, after the war ended, they, they probably all made their peace. Wow. Or they fled to England. I don't know. In what is today the South Bronx. Interesting. And there's your trashy... Found That's a hell of a tale. I'm sure that the housekeeper was not at all a murderess of babies. <laughs> Again, we look back in history and we just think, oh, everyone was so upright and good and and morality mattered. And it just didn't. It, it just, just it didn't. didn't. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't matter at all. They spoke about it differently. They said less about it publicly, but it, no. Trash. Is eternal. And thank the trash candy gods and goddesses for that, because otherwise we would be really bored. That was awesome. So Thanks for kicking us off with Trashy Founding Fathers. That is Governor Morris, a man who contributed so much and also shoved a whalebone up his dick. Wow. <laughs> and died from it. Okay, it literally took me through half the story to figure out the Governor was his actual first name. It's his first name. And not that he was just like governor of something. No. The name So I the name did does pick up on that. In in Dutch maybe the name does mean governor, but it was his mother's last name. And I think it was just pretty common at the time that it was like with the cottons. It's with, in with, the South. Or with the like Mathers. We do that in the South. Yeah, a like lot. Cotton Mather was named for his grandfather John Cotton. Sure. Like I think it was just how we kept names in the family back then so I, there you that go. was fascinating he never served as a governor thank you Stacey. that would have been confusing governor governor, governor morris yeah that's too much i'm glad he never tried that thanks everybody for don't, tuning in don't shove a whale boat up your dick
Who's next, Ben Franklin or TJ? <sighs> Thomas it, Jefferson or Ben Franklin? You let us know who you want. Yeah, please do, because that's a tough call. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. You are the very, very best. You are the very best. Happy Wednesday. Keep your masks on. Keep yep. your hands clean. Sanitize them. Keep your hearts trashy, but not like trashy reading letters from the ambassador's desk in France, y'all. Never that trashy. Ne- never do that. Keep it trashy, y'all. Bye. Bye. Friends, we're in some tough times, and happiness can sometimes seem really almost impossible to achieve. It's a whole lot easier with some help. We recommend BetterHelp Online Counseling. It is convenient, it is confidential, safe, and conducted privately. There are no uncomfortable waiting rooms. You don't even need to leave your home. You choose how and when you connect with your counselor by secure video, by phone, or even chat or text. BetterHelp has over 3,000 licensed professional counselors available across all 50 states. These counselors specialize in lots of areas of assistance that you may need, and services are available to clients worldwide. And it's really easy. There's a simple questionnaire that assesses your needs, and then within 24 hours, you are matched with a counselor. BetterHelp is an affordable way to get counseling. It is less expensive than your traditional counseling options, and BetterHelp does also offer financial aid to those who qualify. And if for any reason you're not happy with your counselor, you can request a new one, no extra charge. Secure, convenient, professional, and affordable. It's a great time to put your happiness first. Visit betterhelp.com slash trashy to get 10% off your first month. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with BetterHelp. That is betterhelp, H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash trashy. Hey friends, we know 2020 is seemingly the longest year ever, but are you still unable to find time to get financially organized? The ladies of the Oak Tree Group are ready and willing to help you. They believe in empowerment through knowledge. And the Oak Tree Group is offering each of our listeners a free one hour conversation about their financial concerns. It's your money, so there are no bad questions. There's still time to make good things happen for you this year. And a few of them might involve some gentle coaching on conscious financial choices. Contact the women of the Oak Tree Group for assistance. Yep, that's right. All of the holistic planners at the Oak Tree Group are female. Check out their website, www.theoaktreegroup.net, for contact details and more information about their services. Say bye bye to 2020 and hello, Financially Smarter 2021, with a little help from the Oak Tree Group. Again, their website is www.theoaktreegroup.net. Alicia, you've been excitedly typing away at your keyboard. <laughs> I'm always excitedly typing away it's at my true, keyboard. But this I'm one like I've... Schroeder at the piano. That is very much the picture I get when I walk past your office. It's the wind done gone. The wind done gone. Yeah, that's it. This is going to wrap up the wind done gone oh. for September because we're coming back oh, right. in October for Trashy Witches. With... And we're starting with the Scottish play. The Scottish play. play. Correct. So we're going to wrap up The Wind Done Gone today with a story I've wanted to tell for ages. This is about George Reeves. Okay. George Reeves played Superman. He did. In the 1950s. Mm-hmm. What does that have to do with Gone with the Wind? It was a super film. George <laughs> Reeves got his break in acting in films in Hollywood. He played one of the Tarleton twins mm, in Gone okay. with the Wind. It was his first movie role, but it was actually his fifth billing. Because that's how long Gone with the Wind takes in post-production. Oh, right. Okay. That he's already filmed, gotten a contract with Warner Brothers to have that be his first movie, he's, but it looks like his fifth. He's gone on to be a big movie star. No, I'm kidding. Well, the thing with this story, I'm putting it in the Wind Done Gone, but it could be an X-Files. It could be a side piece. This is just... Get out your trash candy scooper. It's really good. So George Reeves acted a lot in his time. He has 74 credits before his death occurs in June 1959. He That's, wow. He does perform in Gone with the Wind. He was in The Man Who Talked Too Much. He was in some other notables. Ooh, Too Tough to Die, Samson and Delilah. As well as being the TV series... 
superhero, Superman, hero to all 50s kids and families everywhere. But he dies mysteriously, super mysteriously, way before his time in a call to death by suicide. But is it that or is it murder or is it a hit job? Dun, dun. Let's talk about it. Okay. George Kiefer Brewer is born January 5th, 1914. Capricorn man. His mom and dad got married a few months before old Georgie was born. So that marriage is sort of thought of as a shotgun kind of marriage. So Mama Helen is pregnant and real dad, Mama Helen, they're going to try to make it work for the sake of the kid. But it does not work for sake of the kid or for either of them. So Mama Helen is going to move back to her hometown in the Midwest and we'll take George. And then Helen and baby George will move out to California to stay with Helen's sister so Helen can have some help with the baby. Here's your imago in this story. Mama Helen sort of invents helicopter parenting. Like, got a little Georgie in your life. Back, She's, back before there were helicopters. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. She's kind of a smothering influence. Mom is eventually going to get remarried. And so does natural father. But natural dad is out at this point. George never sees him again. Hmm. Stepdad for Mama Helen is this dude named Frank Besselow. He will, Frank Besselow, he will adopt George when George is 13. And this is a much better relationship for Mama Helen. The three of them live very happily as a family. George is George Besselow. Things are going great. George is going to go to polytechnic school where he begins his love affair. With the actor's life. He's into boxing. It's like his hobby. George will attend Pasadena Junior College and will begin studying at the legendary Pasadena Playhouse, where he will meet the first love of his life. They're the first love he marries. Her name is Eleonora Needles. And Eleonora and George are working together at the Playhouse, and they're young and in love and committed to breaking through. They love the theater. They love the theater. So they're both playing in the Pasadena Playhouse through the 1930s, through the late 30s. And George is seen by a casting agent who needs to cast one of the Tarleton twins for Gone with the Wind, cast as Stuart. He'll get a contract with Warner Brothers because of this, and it's all happening. Right. So he's one of the 50 billion people who have a $175 a week contract with Warner Brothers or whatever. That's it. Okay. It, seriously, it sounds like Hollywood just employed most of America in this period at well, $175 <laughs> a week, unless you were a woman, a white woman, and then it was 60 65. bucks a week. Uh-huh. <laughs> or a black woman, and then it was like Six. eight. Yeah, eight bucks <laughs> yeah. a week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's fair. But it's happening, right, for George, and he gets his contract, and he's going to be in four other movies in quick succession, and then Gone with the Wind comes out, and it's a big hit. But also around this time, Mama Helen, problematic Mama Helen. Will tell George that his stepfather, Frank Bustelow, has committed suicide. And George is really sad. Yeah. But Frank Bustelow did not commit suicide. Mama Helen and Frank just got a divorce. And George doesn't find out about this until significantly later. Wow. Yeah. Some trashy Mama Mago. Mark it on your bingo card. That is, that's rough. But true love is gonna, gonna win out. September 22nd, 1940, Eleonora and George marry. They honeymoon in Southern California. Da, da. They and, live in Southern California, so they just well, took, a, took a drive across the canyon or something. Well, they do eventually on their honeymoon end up going to San Francisco, so Northern California. Northern California. They will come back down to Southern California and right. make their home in Pasadena. A lot of driving. He's a working actor. Eco-terrorist. Working for Warner Brothers, doing short films, doing B-movies, (laughs) eco-terrorist. He'll work with James Cagney and Ronald Reagan. Like, Mm. everybody at this point, this is the early 19, late 1930s, early 1940s. Yeah. Okay. Warner Brothers does not renew George's contract. He'll go to 20th Century Fox. He freelances for a little while. He's trying to make it. Early 1940s, dun-dun-dun, World War II, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So George ends up getting cast in this movie called So Proudly We Hail. It's a war movie. In 1943, he's drafted into the U.S. Army. And, oh, my God, there's this total thing that happens. I don't know if you know about this. 
It's called the First Motion Pictures Unit. So I know we've t- we've alluded uh-huh. to it before, but we're going to do a little deep dive into this for a second. So actors, writers, directors all come. We can't have you fight in the war. Your skills are much too valuable. Well, the Pentagon realized the value of propaganda. Well, and propaganda as- films and training, training films, right. ex- recruitment mm-hmm. films. Exactly. Yeah. So who gets called into this group? Clark Gable, William Holden, Ronald Reagan, mm-hmm. DeForest Kelly, also George Reeves. So uh, the King- yeah, they're like in Culver City or something. They're, they're like right outside of L.A. And- oh, wait on it. So, okay. It's so much fun. Okay. So the general of the U.S. Army goes to Jack Warner and he's like, listen, I need you to head this up. But he brings in Jack Warner and producer Hal Willis, as well as scriptwriter Owen Crump. Hey, you three, I need you to make this uh, first motion pictures unit thing. And Hal Wallace is knee deep in Casablanca. He's like, I cannot do this. So off go Jack Warner and Owen Crump to make movies, which the army needs. Because the first request from this general is we need to recruit 100,000 men into the armed services. That we need a, we need a, a thing to get 100,000 dudes to sign up. This movie will feature Jimmy Stewart. It's directed by John Huston. I, I cannot explain how interconnected Hollywood is. It right. is just spider webs. So the 100,000 soldiers do get recruited. Thing is a total I success. I love this. I'm just picturing these guys like, all right, well, so so what's it pay? Like, not Nothing. much. Not much at all. And I could die. You, in fact, very well yep. might. Mm-hmm. Yep. Could be cool like Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> so this thing because it's successful the first motion pictures unit becomes a total thing and it's set up in jack warner's wing in the studio in burbank but that's not working out and jack warner is like okay i really don't have time to do this anymore or whatever happens so everything moves over to hal roach studios in culver city okay. and all these dudes call their base fort roach Fort Roach, but I it just, had to it had to be the cushiest job in oh all of all of that man's army fighting the war in Culver City. Yep, yeah. Uh, I mean, this was just kind in of front a fun, of and behind the camera. <laughs> we're just kind of a fun spinoff. We haven't really talked about the Hollywood Canteen yet. There's some fun in that one too, but everybody wants to be a patriot. Okay, so <laughs> let's get George back home from fighting at the Culver City front in war. <laughs> And before he goes and joins the war, there's this director, Mark Sandrich, who's like, hey, dude, I know you have to go to war, but I really believe in your potential. And I have all these roles for you when the war is done. But unfortunately, the war ends. George comes back. Mark Sandrich is dead. Hmm. So George is kind of like, ah, what do I do? Now, you know, in the army, they teach skills. So the skill (laughs) was not how do I stay married to my wife, Eleonora? Oh, so whether it was the... Which is the Ronald Reagan story, too. Yeah, the Jane long time battle at the Culver City front. Yeah. Deep, uh, deep in the foxholes there. Right. Lack of cash. <laughs> like, just, it's... Sure. It, they're done, right? So they are kind of going to split from 46, 47, uh, 48. The separation is official in 1949. The divorce will not be official until 1950. But in 49, George Reeves splits and he goes to New York City, greatest city in the world. He's going to get some radio roles and TV is just breaking out. So he gets TV roles. But like a lot of Hollywood people at the time, they're kind of like TV. TV's for suckers. Film is where it's at. Like you have this whole big rivalry, right, between television and film people as and then throw theater people in and it's. It's all a trashy mess. Yeah. Okay. But George gets radio roles and TV roles, but he's like, come on, I'm a movie star. Okay, 1951. He goes back to Hollywood for another movie called Superman and the Mole Men. Oh, as a burgeoning mole person myself, I hope the portrayal (laughs) was kind. He takes the job because it's fucking work. I hope they did not stereotype the, the mole people. Yeah. Well, the problem 
the opportunity or the problem, depending on which side of the Wheel of Fortune card you're flipping in this, George needs the cash. But the shooting on the set of Superman and the Mole Men literally goes so well, they're like, hey, we could make this into a TV show. You want a gig, George? It's going to air on ABC. Kellogg Serial is the main underwriter of the production. And Superman, the TV series, debuts in 1952. And it's a hit with kids and 50s families everywhere. It runs for six seasons in its first run. But George is in his middle age and TV's kind of a drag. It's really fast. It pays... Also, flying is hard. Flying, so. I mean, it wears you out on a middle-aged body. I mean, There's not that's enough Advil the, for that. Yeah, the aerodynamics there are tough as you get older. Well, the problem with TV at this time, because TV studios are doing just as shitty of things to movie stars as movie studios were doing back in the day. Because they're like, that's great. You're under contract for this TV show, but we're only going to give you four weeks of notice when we're about to go into a new season. Hmm. So if you wanted to take an extended sure. run in the theater, if you mm-hmm. wanted to do another film role, you you can't. Yeah. So you can't take other roles. It kind of ties you down. And George doesn't really love it. Again, the Advil in the middle age. It's hard right. on your liver. Right. <laughs> and he is just kind of bummed. He's just like, why me? But it's a paying gig. So when he first lands it, he's going to host his co-star for a cocktail one night. And when he makes his toast, he says, here's to the bottom of the barrel. Like, he thinks television is sure. as low as he can go. But for all of its unhappiness, let me tell you kind of some cool things about George Reeves. He, at the end of every season, will cut the S logo off of his costumes and mail them to ill children in hospitals. Oh. Or, like, kids who wrote in for their birthday and you're my favorite thing. He'll just pick, like, the most deserving children at the yeah. end of every season and send his little S logo to them. Yeah. Isn't that the sweetest thing? That is. I bet there are still a few of those sitting in attics somewhere. Oh, for sure. And George is really feeling this bigger responsibility. He won't be seen smoking in front of kids. He's like, that's a bad example. Where he is heavy of a drinker as he is, he will end up quitting smoking just because he doesn't want kids to, like, it's it's a role model kind of mm-hmm. thing. George will call the cape and tights his monkey suit. But he appears all over organizations and doing stuff for good. And so all of that's great and his public perception is great. But George has been around the block a few times and he likes to party and he likes to drink. And he's in his late 30s and he has a girlfriend. A married girlfriend. <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, her name is Tony Mannix. Tony Mannix. Let's talk about her. She's a Pisces gal. First day of Pisces. Born February 19th. Born in New York City. She's one of 11 kids. Tony is going to begin her illustrious career as a Zigfield Follies girl. Where she will meet Eddie Mannix. This is mid-1930s. And Tony is going, Tony Lanier is her name at this point. She is going to become Eddie's side piece because Eddie is still married to his sweet wife, Bernice, who he has been married to since 1916. But by 1937, Bernice really wants to divorce Eddie because he's That's so weird. around. I can't imagine why. Bernice will march down to the courthouse and file her petition stating adultery, Natch, And also that Eddie Mannix beats her. Ooh. But before anything can actually be filed, Bernice will die in a mysterious car accident. Oh, my God. In Palm Springs in November of 1937. Some people say. Really? Eddie Mannix had Bernice murdered. Do they? It's a different story for a different day. But right now, 1937, Eddie Mannix. Grieving. Killer Eddie. Killer Eddie. Alleged. (laughs) Alleged Killer Eddie. Grieving Widow. Is now free to take on Tony Lanier and all of her her stuff. But y'all, Tony's going to stay on the hook until 1951. They won't get married for another 14 years Hmm. to bring him to the altar. So when Eddie does finally get there, 
Eddie and Tony kind of hate each other. They are both notoriously unfaithful. So here are Tony Mannixes, married to Eddie Mannix, who, if you don't remember, is the MGM fixer. I mean, sorry, studio executive VP. Gotcha. And probably most assuredly, definitely tied to the mafia. So Tony and Eddie are married and they're miserable, but they're both really Catholic. So divorce, out of the question. Murder, eh. But both Eddie and Tony are fucking around. Like, there's so much fucking around. Sure. But they're both cool with all the fucking around. Well, they're Catholic. Because they can't get divorced <laughs> and they're Catholic. So sorry. So then Tony Mannix falls smitten kitten in love with George Reeves. It's the worst kept secret in Hollywood. Like, everybody knows it's happening. They're together nine years. Hmm. They're together almost a decade. Because the Mannix marriage, right? Uh, Total front. And Tony's fooling around. Eddie doesn't care. Eddie has a Japanese side piece. Sure. Sitting in the valley. Whatever. Tony, again, nine years senior. And so George is on her hook as a side piece for a long time. (laughs) Mickey Cohen We'll say that Tony Mannix was the only person in Hollywood who had any balls. Okay. Tony is going to love George and do a lot to buy his love and affection. There are nice gifts and cars. There's a nice little two-story home at 1579 Benedict Canyon Drive, north of Sunset Boulevard in the Hollywood Hills. They're well-liked as a couple. All of his friends really like her. He calls her Ma. She calls him the boy. Oh, God. They like to party. They're having a marvelous time. And all of his buddies, her friends, throughout this time, like, Eddie's not feeling great. Right? This is 19th decade of the 1950s. And everybody kind of thinks George and Tony will get married when Eddie Mannix finally bites it. And Tony's free to marry again. It does not work out that way. So here's Tony. Older, beautiful, but fixated that and living in fear that George is going to leave her for someone younger. She's always terrified she's going to be replaced. And this becomes part of her very large psychosis in the relationship they have together. Right. So it's buying him off. And what else can I do for you materially to ensure that you will not, in fact, leave me? So in the mid-50s, George Reeves is 40, and he is so tired of doing the Superman thing. And again, all that Advil. He wants to start his own production company. The Superman people are like, hey, we'll give you more money. And the production company kind of falls through. And, like, there's so much liquor. He's a heavy drinker, and things aren't great. And, oh, gosh. In 1958... Tony's worst fear comes true. And George is now smitten kitten Uh over a new lady. And her name is Lenore Lemon. Let me tell you about Lenore Lemon. She's born May 11th, 1923. Lenore is the daughter of a very successful Broadway ticket broker. But let's scoop a little trash on her before we get her to the depot. Okay. Back in 1941... So Lenore, being 22 years old, does make a very successful marriage to Jacob L. Webb, called Jakey, who is the great-great-grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt. Little scratch there in that guy's pocket. Well, that marriage lasts eight days. Whoa. Eight days later, Lenore leaves old Jakey in the dust, goes crying to her mother and says, he was covered in tattoos from head to toe and I was scared. This is a huge scandal in the society papers. I don't know exactly what happens with that because the marriage is pretty fast, but it doesn't ever really get dissolved because Lenore is going to face bigamy charges the next time that she wants to cool, cool. marry, which she does, musician, yeah, clearly. Amish Menzies. They're going to divorce as well. So Lenore Lemon is like a New York City party girl. She's a socialite. She is banned. She is 86th out of certain clubs because she likes to get drunk and fight physically with other people. Excellent. That's the temperament you want. Also, 
Lenore most probably, definitely, allegedly, for sure, also has ties to the mafia. So there is not a terrific reputation built around Lenore by the time she breezes into the trashy depot in 1958. So Tony Mannix is out. Lenore Lemon is in, and Tony is pissed. She's really pissed. Lots of phone calls, lots of desperate pleas for George's love, kind of harassing the both of them. And George's friends don't love Lenore quite the way they did Tony. Like, she's okay, but then she drinks, and then she's prone to violence and outbursts. And other people will say, yeah, that girl's a straight-up gold digger. She milks men for everything she can get and then simply moves on. And George Reeves looks great to her. Right. George Reeves is smitten. She's young. Mm -hmm. She's beautiful. She's a hothead. Well, and he's been with someone for years who is unavailable. Right. And there's Lenore Mm -hmm. who loves and adores him. And if Lenore is looking to gold dig, it's super fine. But without Tony Mannix money, George Reeves has a lot less. Ah, yeah. Cash floating around. A lot less gold to dig. Yeah. And it used to be nothing for George to go to Eddie Mannix for money. For parts, like, Eddie Mannix approved of this relationship. You keep my wife happy. Thanks so much. But he can't go to Eddie Mannix anymore. So that connection isn't there. So Lenore is not going to stay happy for long. Okay. So now we have Tony Mannix utterly humiliated, to add insult to injury, George is going to move Lenore into that two-story home that she bought for him. That Tony is paying for in yeah in the Hollywood Hills. It's super trashy. Okay, this is all 1958. So let's get to 1959 Mm. because this is a year when bills become due. Mm. Well, if I was going to flip a tarot card, it would be the Wheel of Fortune because there are a lot of bad things that happened to George this year, including. That he stops being George. (laughs) Well, there are midnight phone calls Mm. that happen. Mm. His beloved Schnauzer is kidnapped. Mm. He is involved in three car accidents. Wow. In the first, two trucks almost crush him. In the second, a speeding car almost hits him head on until he's able to get out of the way. This is very Beatrice-like. Is that her name? The first wife? Bernice. (laughs) Bernice. The third accident is far more serious. Uh, He is driving down the Hollywood Hills, and all of a sudden, Georgie has no brakes. Oh, shit. And he will crash his car into a pillar, Mm -hmm. leaving him injured. And now not only a heavy drinker, but on painkillers. That car is taken to a mechanic to look at post-accident, and the mechanic's like... I can't reckon, but all the brake fluid has been drained from this car. It's super mysterious. Things get worse. The late night phone calls that were coming in that weren't any words. They were just annoying. We're going to call and wake you up and not say anything. Now those calls are threatening to murder him. So they're talking now with murder. And so if you had been thinking that someone was trying to kill you, that might solidify your suspicion. Easy solution. Just unplug your phone. Yeah. He's getting like 20 I'm going to murder you calls a day. Just don't answer. So George is going to. You know how you frustrate murderers? You you, (laughs) don't even answer. You don't even listen to their voicemails. Don't even. For all I know, my phone is covered in threats. Delete. (laughs) George is going to go down to the L.A. District Attorney. He's going to file a report. I would. And the district attorney is like, "Uh, do you have any idea who may uh, want you dead? And George is like, maybe Tony Mannix. I don't know. So the authorities launch an investigation. And Tony Mannix is like, no, it's super weird. I'm getting phone calls too. I'm getting the same kind of phone calls. Now, maybe Tony's lying. Maybe Eddie is playing the both of them. No one ever knows because this is how much the story is completely fixed, fixed, refixed, photoshopped and covered over. But that's the bad stuff happening to George Reeves. But there's good stuff happening too. Superman is sold in syndication in Australia. So there's an influx of new cash. Third love, (laughs) Lenore and George are going to get engaged. 
George is going to get $20,000 to do this big celebrity appearance. Hmm. Oh, and the Superman people are like, George, we know you really want to quit Superman, but uh, we're going to give you a shit ton more money and also let you direct these 26 episodes. So George is like, all of that sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. He's also working on a movie with his co-star from Superman. Like, things are... Like, George Coming is in around. a really, mm-hmm. really good place. This is summer 1959. And George and Lenore are getting ready. They're packing their bags. Suitcases getting packed. Because they're going to Spain in three days to get married and have a honeymoon. Because he's doing a role there. I'd stay put. And they're going to go do this before the filming of Superman starts in the fall. Mm-hmm. And George is feeling good and hopeful and things are going great. Which brings us to June 15th. Mm. Where it gets a little tricky. George and Lenore maybe go to dinner at Chasen's and have a lot to drink. Maybe Robert Corden is there. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're home with Robert Corden. There's a lot of rumors. There's no clear agreement on any part of what happens. Zero. At any rate, George and Lenore are home or get home from Chasen's. There's a lot of liquor. George is on painkillers, right? Because he's lack of brake fluid crashed into the pillar. He's also hurt his hand. So he's claimed disability, his right hand. He's claimed disability from the studio, which makes it weird. There's a gunshot in his right temple with his right hand with the, it's very suspicious. So George and Lenore are like, great, let's go to bed. And then there's a knock at the door, like at midnight. So... Dude named William Bliss and another one of their neighbors who may be fucking Robert Condon, who's staying with them. Like the staying with who? George and Lenore. Okay. It's all the whole story is fucked because no two accounts are exactly the same. Because everyone's hiding something different, basically. That's it. Okay. So the knock at the door, Lenore and George come down, and everybody has another drink in the most commonly accepted story. Because everybody really needs another nightcap. That's exactly what we're all going for here. And George, at some point, is just frustrated. And some accounts say he gets up and says, I'm going to bed. I'm going to shoot myself. And sure enough, according to the story of some of the witnesses, the drunk witnesses, there's a single shot upstairs a few moments later. And George is found naked, dead at the age of 45. From a gunshot wound, death by suicide is what the coroner will determine. It's unusual to have a ton of witnesses. Well, not witnesses. They were not watching it. No, but I mean, he, yeah. he according to them, he stood up, made an announcement, went upstairs, and moments later followed through on that announcement. Like, yeah. that's very strange. Well, they may have had an hour to decide that because it's going to take an hour to call the cops. Gotcha. So they could be bailing drugs. They could be bailing liquor. They could be trying to get their stories straight. Because the cops show up an hour later, and now there are a lot of really drunk people trying to tell the cops what has happened. Many variations. Witness reports, police reports, tabloid reports all differ. What is whispered then and what is said later? Let's talk about it. The cops not only find the death by suicide gunshot, but there are also five other bullet holes in the walls and the floor of the bedroom. And Lenore's like, ooh, I accidentally fired a gun moons ago. George Reeves has no powder marks on his wound. Indicating it was fired from a distance. Correct. So the gun would have to be further away, which is very unusual in death by suicide. There are no fingerprints on that gun. He was probably wearing gloves and then took them off and then put them away and then died. Well, that makes sense because the shell casing of the gun is found underneath his body. So if he took off the gloves, he was able to come back and sit down and then, yeah. There's an odd (laughs) angle of the bullet. The shell casing is underneath his body. The cops come. And make either no photographic prints of the scene, the body, no fingerprints, no anything, 
The crime scene is a mess. George Reeves' body goes to the coroner's office where George Reeves is embalmed before his autopsy. Let me guess, at this point in the history of the police department in Los Angeles or whatever municipality this is... It was L.A. Confidential, you. Um, yeah. It's so infested with the mob and organized crime that... Well, and Eddie Mannix is the fixer uh-huh. for the mob and the cops. Right. And the student, like... Right. Eddie Mannix is the... Okay. Right. Just saying. This I- sounds like... There's so much mud that they've already churned up that you're like, even if you could find a clear narrative, there are so many competing narratives that like, this is, this seems like classic. This is why we're never going to solve it. This classic organized crime. Isn't it trashy? mm -hmm. Okay. They do find 0.27 blood alcohol content. You go, George. So three times the legal limit. So he was wasted. Definitely. Under the influence, but George is also a very heavy drinker, Mm. right? There are strange bruises on his body. The police get there. They are told it's a straight up suicide. And that's what the police are going to classify it as. But no one in Hollywood then or now ever thinks that it's a real suicide. Mama Helen, remember her? She's like, I would like my son's body back now. Right. And she sends it to their hometown coroner where a different autopsy happens. And they're like, oh, this is definitely homicide. But the police in L.A. are like, nope, death by suicide. Not even going for that. Because so nothing... like he was he was beaten beforehand. Is that kind of the implication? Isn't that strange? Yeah, there's some unusual... Strapped into a chair and mm-hmm. punched him a bunch of them. No, I, well, Lenore, remember, likes to get violent. Uh, uh huh. Okay, so nothing in this case makes sense. It gets lots of rumors and conjecture. It's all very mysterious. George's friends and Mama Helen are like, George was so happy and he was doing great. Money was coming in. Yeah. He had a new film. He was, about to he get was married. directing. Yeah, he would not have killed himself. So mom and friends kind of go on a mission to prove that it's murder and not suicide. Meanwhile, the news of George Reeves' death is rocking play school water coolers everywhere, right? The comic Superman has been out since 1938. So, like, for 20 years later, George Reeves has been the human embodiment of Superman for, like, eight years now. He's beloved. Kids are heartbroken. Theories. Let's talk about it. The wrongest, (laughs) R-O-N-G, theory, death by suicide. Maybe it really was just what they said it was and there's nothing more to it. I don't think this is the case. There's another theory that Superman producer Tommy Carr said for years. He's like, someone entered that house with a gun and murdered George Reeves. Maybe it was on the command of Eddie Mannix, maybe Tony Mannix. The gunman gets out quietly through the upstairs or tells everybody in the house, don't tell anybody I was here. Yeah, sounds like there was some witness tampering uh, in in the immediate Well, because remember William Bliss, who shows up with that other lady, the theory that Tommy Carr purports is that when Lenore went to answer the door, she talked to William, to Bill Bliss and that lady outside, leaving the hitman time to get in and up the stairs to the bedroom and hide out, right? Waiting for George's re-entrance upon. Which makes you think, was William Bliss there by accident? Or was he there on purpose? Again, but half of the stories say they all came in and had a drink. Yeah, so, yeah. okay. Another theory that is heavily promoted is that Lenore Lemon argued that night and she just straight up shot him in the heat of the moment. There are witness accounts that say she came downstairs after the gunshot because she was upstairs with George when it happened. She comes down immediately after and says, you have to tell the police I was down here. Like it takes an hour, it's right? Plausible. Mm-hmm. For the, for them to call the fuzz. Now to add insult to injury, George Reeves has not changed his will. So his entire estate goes to Tony Mannix, who is left trying to explain to the papers, oh, we 
just worked on so many charities together that he certainly thought I would be the best executor. Best executor, yeah, of his will. Lenore Lemon is pissed. She says, Tony got a house for charity. I got a broken heart. <laughs> Lenore Lemon is so pissed, she is going to break back into the crime scene. I mean, home. A few days later. Steal food. Steal booze. Steal the $4,000 in traveler's checks that they had gotten that day. For Spain, yeah. For Spain, for their marriage honeymoon. Lenore does not attend George's memorial service. She takes off and goes back to New York City. She distances herself from him. She will say, he's just been so depressed. She actually confesses, like, to plenty of people later on down the line, but she's never called in for questioning. She's pissed. She, all she talks about is his death was a huge inconvenience. Oh, my God. Lenore Lemon will die New Year's Eve 1989. She lives a long time. If she is a murderer. Okay. The other theory is Tony Mannix sent that hitman to have him murdered, right? He's crashing his car all over. George has a co-star, Phyllis Coates. They're friends and she's his Superman co-star. And Phyllis says, I got a call within an hour of his death from Tony Mannix hmm. that described the scene to me. There are five bullet holes in the bedroom and the sheets are now in the wash. And... Tony Mannix is telling this whole story to Phyllis Coates before the authorities right. have even been called. Okay. So maybe it does go through Eddie Mannix. Maybe Eddie is mad that George Reeves crushed his wife's poor, poor, broken, tiny heart. And like Eddie Mannix is a bad dude. And like Eddie liked George for long enough, gave him jobs, gave him cash. But when George breaks Tony's heart, now Game Eddie on. is protecting his wife, and this embarrasses me and destroys the public perception we have of our marriage, so maybe he calls his mob buddies. Maybe Eddie was behind those phone calls. He has a whole corrupt police force in his pocket. Super easy to make it happen. It's easy to help Tony make it happen. Whew. Rule to suicide. Overprotective helicopter mom will die in 1964. She is buried next to her son. She even helicopters him in his grave. Eddie Mannix dies in 1963. Tony is going to live another 30 years beyond that. She lives to 1983. Wow. But on Tuesdays and Fridays, Tony has something that she always does, which is holds prayer sessions. And liturgies to George at the shrine that she has built for him in her home. So she has assistants and friends and everyone comes over to kneel and pray to George. Like Tony's a devout Catholic. She will confess to others later that she hired someone to murder George. I couldn't have him and... I didn't want anyone else to have him, and she will miss and worship George for the rest of her life. So every woman in his life claims to have killed him at some point yeah. after his death? Yeah, everybody's, cl yeah. That's amazing. And she will repetitively confess to her priest. Like, every time the priest comes over for confession, she's like, I had George murdered. and But she felt something about it, but people that know her are like, nah, dude, she had dementia. Like, she's warped herself sure. so much in this 40 years of yeah. praying to his shrine. So, Lenore admits it. Tony admits it. Eddie doesn't admit it. He, but but Eddie died soon after, basically. Right. And Eddie probably had a bunch of people killed. <laughs> so, are we ever going to know what happened? No. no. We got drunk witnesses, MGM fixers, lack of evidence, corrupt misconstrued police. evidence, corrupt police, most of the people who are involved are long ago past. So whatever likely the truth is, like it may fall out at this late a date, but I think this one is going to remain a mystery. I do have one other fun thing. If you are interested in going to visit the original costume that George Reeves wore in Superman and you are near Metropolis, Illinois, it's right there. In the fucking Superman Museum. 
there is a Superman museum in Metropolis, Illinois. This is from their webpage. The world famous Superman Museum officially opened in 1993 in the Man of Steel's official hometown of Metropolis, Illinois on Superman Square. The museum features 70,000 plus items. From the life's work of longtime Superman enthusiast and collector Jim Hambrick, who has amassed one of the greatest collections of Superman memorabilia in the world. Among the items showcased in the museum from the iconic superhero 75 plus year history are virtually every Superman toy ever produced, as well as movie props and promotional materials from all the Superman movies and TV series, including Smallville and Man of Steel, and one of the only George Reeves Superman costumes still in existence. The Super Museum has received many honors, as well as being awarded number one small town attraction in America. It has been proudly featured on television, on the shows The Daily Show, Entertainment Tonight, Extra, Treasures in Your Home, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, TNN, blah, blah, blah. If you ever have the opportunity to travel to Metropolis, Illinois, we invite you to stop by the Super Museum for some super fun for the entire family. Three exclamation points. Super fun. A TD alum connection here, Ben Affleck does a movie where he portrays George Reeves yes. called Hollywood Land. It was one of his comeback roles after yeah. um, shit with J-Lo went down. It was... Yeah. It's an all right film. I mean, it's it's fine. It kind of gets into one angle of George Reeves' suspicious death. There's also a future spider web in this because this is Eddie Mannix as it pertains to this case and his wife, Tony. Y'all, Eddie Mannix, there's a whole trashy future spider web on this dude. He is in all the scandals. He's involved in the Paul Byrne suicide. He, according, allegedly, is involved in helping Clark Gable cover up his drunk driving homicide murders. Oh, he also, Eddie Mannix, also destroys the porn tape of Joan Crawford. Eddie Mannix is also a minor character in Gore Vidal's book, Myron. So Gore Vidal and Truman Capone have this interwined history. And Gore Vidal is also the stepbrother of Jacqueline Kennedy Mm -hmm. and Lee Residuel. Like, there's a whole Eddie Mannix thing coming up. I don't want you to think that that's not happening, but it wasn't part of this story. Okay. That is the When Done Gone side piece X-Files story of George Reeves. The true crime murder, probably. Maybe of George Reeves. Superman. If there's no powder residue, it is all very suspicious. That is a, that is a, I mean, as someone who has watched a lot of Law and Order in my day, I watch Criminal Minds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is, that's a clue right there. That's what we call a clue in the, uh, in the biz. Rut row, (laughs) Raggy. I did see a funny tweet this morning that, uh, Criminal Minds is Scooby Doo for women in their forties. <laughs> I can't. It's too dark. I can't watch it. Criminal Minds, yeah, you can't. No, it's, it's not your thing. It's uh, it gives me nightmares. I am a fan of Matthew Kubler Cray. He's so cute. <laughs> okay, that is the trashy story of George and Tony and Lenore and the George Dungon. The George Dungon. That's it. That's all Sorry, I got. that's probably disrespectful. That's so sad. Thank you. That was wasn't that fun. Yeah, that I was. Mean, it's, tra- it's not fun. It's sad and tragic no, it's and a, trashy. But... It's a Hollywood true crime. It mysteries and mm-hmm. scandals. Yeah, yeah. Thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that and the wrap of at least for now the wind and gone. There are a few other threads, but I think I'll get to them in different ways. Come back next Tuesday. For Trashy Trashy Witches and Macbeth. I can't wait. Keep your masks on. Keep your hands clean. Wash them. Wash them, wash them. Like little trash pandas. Uh, But that heart. Ah, so trashy. You gotta keep that heart trashy. Otherwise, the light could get in. You could feel joy. (laughs) We don't want that for you. Trashy hearts are (laughs) joyful. You've got this all wrong. I do. We love you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for listening. Mm Y'all are awesome. Have a great day. Tuesday. Yes. Cheers, friends. Sayonara. Adios. 
Bye, Acondius. Ciao. Bye. Au revoir. Just in the damn tape. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Trash Pandas, thanks for listening. Trashy Divorces is written and produced by us, Stacy and Alicia, for Hemlock Creatives. You can contact us at trashydivorces at gmail.com. Our art is by Sydney V. Smith, Sydney V. Smith at carbonmade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find her at Ratsy's store on Instagram. Check out episode sources, photos, soundtracks, merch store, and more at trashydivorces.com. Need more trash candy? Our Patreon community includes some of the bestest humans around, as well as a bunch of bonus content every week. Join the fun at patreon.com slash trashy divorces. Last but not least, come play with us on social. We are at trashy divorces at Instagram, which Alicia mostly runs. Twitter, which Stacy mostly runs. And on Facebook, which, which we split. We, split. <laughs> we also have a trashy divorces discussion group on Facebook. If you want to chat with other trashy divorces listeners. Thanks again for listening. Keep Keep it it trashy, trashy, y'all.